Climate change has become a global phenomenon and is getting intensely affecting farmers, not only in the crop, but also in the fishery sector. My name is Enyunam and this is the Ghanaian farmer. If you have any questions or thoughts, you can share that. Get interactive on our social media platform, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or YouTube, the Ghanaian farmer. Today, we are in flow cell, yes. Last year, we were here to do a lot of interviews enlightening you about fish production here in Ghana. Today, we are focusing on something different that has to do with climate change. A lot of times when you hear about climate change, your mind goes straight to people who are planting vegetables, cereals, root and all that. But per my understanding or per what I am learning today in Flow Cell, climate change is equally affecting fish production here in Ghana. Let's chit chat with the CEO of Flow Cell to tell us more about how to even identify the signs, the symptoms when you are having or experiencing climate change in your farm. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Danso. It's been a while. How have you been faring? Oh, we've been uh, coping, hanging in here, trying our best to put food on your table as usual. Right. That's our mandate to ensure that there's food security. So that's what we try to do. Thank you and well done. Thank you. Well done for holding the fort even in the midst of all these challenges. Thank you. And Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, what they call International Women's Day as well. We thank you. Like you mm. Telling the story of agriculture to the world. Thank you. And we live to see many more years of Amen. production. Amen. Thank you. Now, let's enlighten ourselves a bit. When we say climate change, what exactly are we referring to? Climate change is just basically change in climate. Okay. Because we all live in a climate. All right. The fish live in a certain climate. Humans live in a certain climate. We sleep in a certain climate. So we all live in a certain climate and we have certain preference uh, for climate. Okay. So when there begins to be um, deviations from that preference, is what we call the change in climate okay. or climate change. Right. In which ways does climate change affect fish production? Fish is just any uh, an animal like any of us. We are all under the uh, kingdom animalia. Just like before you sleep now in your house, I think if your temperature in your room is 48 or 50 degrees, you will not sleep in, in your room. Uh, but if your temperature is around 22 to 24 degrees, it's cold enough for your body to realize that it's time to shut down and sleep or it's time to do other activities. Uh, fish as well, prefer to, to survive or thrive at certain temperature ranges. Mm. Uh, tilapia and clarias of catfish which we work with um, had a preference temperature range of 27 to 28.5 or 29 degrees. This is the perfect temperature for them to reproduce, for them to maintain their normal body functions to make sure their organs are okay, their heart, their skin, their liver, everything else is okay. And also to reproduce and be able to derive the optimum energy from the feed that we give them. So they require this, they prefer this temperature. So if you take tilapia for instance, above uh, 31 to 32 degrees, <laughs> They can, if the tilapia is like the size of my palm, 250, okay. degree, uh, 250 grams, they can probably eat about uh, maybe 1.5% uh, of their body weight to 2%. But when the temperature is optimum for them around 28, they can do about 3 to 3.5%. And then they can get the best, at, the best mm. nutrition mm. out of the food you're mm. giving them. And then when temperatures will drop, to 26 and below, mm -hmm. their feed response will go down, mm -hmm. and then once we are going below 26, we are now at 24, 20. Uh, their metabolic activities will begin to shut down. Okay. Their heart will not work at the optimum. Mm -hmm. Their blood flow, their liver, everything will not be at optimum. And when you get down to 16 degrees, they shut down altogether. 15, they are dead and gone. You throw them away. Wow. So every organism has a 
preference system it works with. Yeah, it so works. a little change causes little change, uh, mortality. Uh, for instance, when uh -huh. you are breeding the eggs to, that you, you see in the incubation right. room there, uh -huh. they prefer to uh, uh, hatch at 28 to 30 degrees. Mm. At that temperature, we can hatch them uh, within three days mm. or four days, maximum five. When the temperature goes to 34, we can hatch them within two to three days. Mm. Temperature goes to 35. 36 we can hatch them in a day temperature goes to 36 and above all your your fingers your fries you hatch will become males wow yes and then temperature gets close to 40 you have cooked them okay so the temperature is very important for right us. and then back to their their bedrooms their uh -huh. breeding ponds yeah where they do mommy and daddy uh -huh. stuff uh, they also prefer to do that ideally between 20 to 28 degrees mm. so if we have the kind of situation like we are having now mm. where sometimes during the day temperature which is 42 mm. when the ambient is 42 mm -hmm. then the water is usually about four or five degrees lower so that means the water will come to 40 degrees 39 degrees and that temperature is not ideal for them to cross so they are going to consume your feed they are going to consume your energy, they are going to spend uh, electricity to exchange water for them and stuff, but biologically they will not be functional, they will not be able to do what they are supposed to do. So if one female is, uh, have, has the capacity to give you um, 200 eggs in a month, you probably be getting 20 to 30. In that case, how, as, how do I get to know if climate change is affecting my pond? Because the pond are usually exposed today. Yes. The, uh, I mean, open weather. It's very open. Yes. Uh, the larger your pond, the more complicated your issue is. Okay. We have relatively small ponds in Ghana. This is just like a hundred meter square area. Right. And most of the ponds are like hundred square meters. Area. But I've seen ponds that are like uh, twenty thousand meter square area, like five or four football pitch together. Joined together. In one, being one pond in other places, not in Ghana. Okay. So and and they are also exposed to those things yeah and so uh how you can tell basically is primarily yourself actually these days it's a lot easier almost everybody has smartphones that you can go to AccuWeather or google can tell you the the temperature when you wake up actually most people see it mm. by default your phone will tell you that oh the temperature is this uh, you know, the, the thing is that even your phone, when it's hot and you charge, it doesn't yes, charge. Yes, yes. Because even your phone has, yeah. uh, you know, uh, climatic, yeah. climatic issues now. So, so you wake up, you see that the temperature reading on your phone is indicated there. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, how do you interpret this? Yeah. And how do you know what to do? Exactly. You know, how do you know what to do? Even as you walk around, sometimes you go like, oh, today the weather is very warm. warm so, uh -huh. yay, you need more water. Yes. Water. Yes. And if you realize these days, yeah. you need a lot more water. Mm. Last week, temperatures were about 42 or some places like home. Mm -hmm. Temperatures were 43, 44. Mm -hmm. You know, and then about two hours after the rain comes, you, you get it. So yeah. those are very short extremes mm -hmm. within a short period mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. All animals mm -hmm. get exposed to that. Yeah. And nobody likes that, mm -hmm. including your fish. Mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, we need more um, kind of awareness. It's easy to measure. From your phone number one like i said you can also have thermometers around to tell in other places the mount wall thermometers around to know the temperature uh, you see these things have been around for a while but we have not been exposed to it so we've taken it for granted in okay. europe you wake up you enter in the elevator the first thing you see is the temperature oh. on the television the weather forecast is the first thing you want to see yeah. it's winter mm -hmm. uh, what temperature are we going to do with today five degrees mm -hmm. minus whatever then people are prepared to mm -hmm. what to do but here we've been so used for a long time to almost the same temperature mm. that now that the changes are coming you are feeling it problem to recognize okay. it and then we also don't know what to do if you recognize mm. it how enlightening are fish farmers about climate change issues um, not almost all of them are enlightened some few people know that yeah maybe temperatures are this maybe temperatures are that Yes, but what is the impact on your fish? Not a lot of them know. At this particular season, when you go around from farm to farm, a lot of uh, uh, 
hatcheries are having very very low outputs okay. because uh, the temperatures are generally low okay. and, uh, and even us temperatures sorry temperatures are very high right. even for us temperatures are very high so output is low mm. so we are feeding the fish the same they eat about one percent of their body weight a day so when so the temperature is high the right, you, they the consume process. more food but yet they don't give you the production rates yes if you, if you put it as simple as that mm. they mean that even if you are at 50 degrees mm -hmm. they consume more no. okay above 32 mm -hmm. they are stressed and they will not do anything they will not respond okay so how enlightening are your colleague farmers about the effect of climate change uh, it comes with experience it's not everybody who who knows this mm. it's not everybody who knows the impact of climate change on the functionality of the animal right. we are working with mm. uh, they know most of them when they put feed uh -huh. and the fish response mm. they are good to go okay. yes and then response to feed does not always tell you what they are going through yeah. okay now is there any mandated institution that is supposed to be enlightening you in the current trends in the sector you find yourself or you are left to your fate you you, have, you are your own Unfortunately, yes, we are left to our fate. Ideally, you know, in our regulatory regime, we are operating with the Fishery Act. And uh, I think Act of 2000, I don't remember that, but we can figure that out later. But the EPA charges us, you know, the climate is part of the environment. Mm -hmm. So they charge us fees and they give us nothing, literally. Environmental Protection Agency. Yes. Charge fish farmers fees. Oh, yes. For what? I have a bill on my desk of... Uh, close to 10,000 CDs or something I have What is the fee for? What is it? What That's are they the charging thing. When I pay for? my pastor, I pay him because he prays for me. Okay. When I pay my lawyer, it's because I want him to defend my case for yes. me. But our EPA people here in Ghana, I'm not trying to sabotage anybody's right. role, but I don't think they are doing enough to sensitize the uh, producers that, uh, hey, uh, information we've gathered from our resources and also from our colleagues in the... Uh, meteorological department mm. temperatures are projected to be like this mm -hmm. and like that mm -hmm. for the next how many Few months? months and those of you who we are collecting one cities for for aquaculture activities uh, this is the impact you should expect mm. and uh, this is what you should do mm. a bit of this also could be played by the extension service providers, okay. uh, which we, that, which is something that is missing in the aquaculture value chain in Ghana. You don't have experts in the line of extension. No, 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 no. It's, it's not there at all. It's not there. How? I've seen, I've seen proper extension services run by investors. Don't we have such courses in our investors? Do we have or the, we don't? The programs are there for somebody to provide you an extension service. Say aquaculture, uh -huh. you need to take. A practitioner from the field okay. train the person expose the person to what the best practices are what the norms are before you let the person out to go and and face the challenges out there and guide farmers everywhere in the world they are well structured institutionalized and supported extension uh, systems maybe to some extent we have it for cocoa mm. Yes, I think cocoa is yes, one of the best. Yes, we have it for crop farmers. Yes, crop and cocoa is yes. one of the best examples yes. that you will see. Yes. But we don't have for fish. Why? Have you guys spoken about it? Yes, we have. In more recent times, uh, they recruited some veterinary people, which I would say is just a portion of what is required okay. because these are specialized in fish health only. Right. But fish health is not the only thing. Right. They train them locally here and I think some of them went to continue in Norway and they are back in the system now. Right. Maybe the government absorbed them but majority of them have not been absorbed. This I know for sure. Okay. And we are pushing for this to happen so that we can the farmers know who to talk to mm. because a lot of the farmers do not know where to turn. Mm. These are people who are investing a lot of money and are not aware of certain challenges that could happen. Mm. Okay, but if that happens, they mm. don't know where to turn. Mm. I've seen uh, extension services run. I'll give you a good example from Auburn University mm. in Alabama, mm -hmm. where the extension service is stationed at the ponds, okay. work with the farm. Mm. I actually met one of them who has been taking samples from the bottom of the pond for 40 years. Okay. And this guy can close his eyes and tell you what each season is going to be Look like, like and what the farmer should be prepared right. for. I've seen him move around with, I call it the fish ambulance. Okay. It's a dedicated vehicle right. with 
all the equipment needed to run a laboratory test, test, test there. on your first farm. Yes, on the farm. So he comes, he takes samples, he analyzes, he knows mm, this one, the way it's behaving, this farmer is likely to have this problem or that problem. Sends his report right away to the vet. The vet, the vet does a prescription. It goes for approval and from there it goes to the feed supplier. The feed supplier inculcates the medication into the feed and then it's sent to the farm. So the farmer is not even seeing the medication. I've seen these work. This, this is what we wish and pray for that will help us. These are all the requirements to, to make the industry work. To work. Okay. And it's one of the reasons why we are doing this training now okay. so we can get people uh, to know what is required to make the whole system mm. Mm. functional. Okay. Okay. And then coming back to the issue of mm -hmm. your the climate, mm. the c climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, people or farmers can detect it by use of simple thermometers. Okay. Uh, not exactly the clinical mm. ones, but the uh, farm-based ones. I have samples in the office I can show you. You can drop probably from the bottom of the mm. pond, and then you can tell what uh, the temperature is, exactly. and then you know what to do. Okay. The other issues is that. When the weather is very sunny, like what we are seeing yeah. today, the surface of the water will get very hot. Okay. Have you ever jumped into a swimming pool in the afternoon before? Yeah. Uh -huh. You see, the surface is very warm. Yeah. Down, down the, is very cold. Yes. Okay. The swimming pool environment is not very organic. Mm. So the quality of the water there is almost consistent throughout, I mean, to some extent. Yeah. But in this, at the bottom of the pond, you have unconsumed feed. Okay. You have fish pool. You have dead algae, mm -hmm. you have dead fish, all the organic matters are settling at the bottom. Down there. So the water at the bottom has a different characteristic from the, the water on, on top. top. So all the organic materials at the top all are pulling oxygen to decompose. Right. Then on top uh -huh. of the water, where the temperatures get high, when the water gets very high, will now be you know hot water mm -hmm. on cold mm -hmm. water. What mm -hmm. will happen? The water will flip over. Yeah. When that happens all the unclean water at the bottom uh -huh. now comes to the top and the fish is now forced to live in the unclean water and that creates unhygienic conditions for, for them fish. it becomes stressful the fish diseases also come in and the mortality is and the mortality happening. so you see everything is connected yes apart from the temperature regulating uh -huh. the physiological mm. characteristics mm. of the animals mm. and stuff mm. the chemistry can also be affected. Mm. So it's not only biological. I see. It's the chemistry as well. So uh, we pray that every day our farmers will get more awareness, education, more education, more knowledge through right. channels like this, okay. where uh, they can understand the mm. impact of these mm. things mm. and know that hey, if the temperature is just three degrees today, just just three degrees higher, just three degrees. I know higher, what to do. It, it means a whole lot. Okay. Okay. Now, if, if let's, let's also touch, if the climate change well, is affecting the temperature, and let's say you are at the stage of hatchery, um, what do you do at that point in time to safeguard what you have there? If you are spawning, like, like what's going on in the breeding ponds there right yes. now, one of the first things you will see is that your yield will begin to go down. The number of fries you are getting per pond, per female in the pond, right. will start to go down. Then that should be your first thing that you see. Then the, the, you want to go and look at your temperature recording. What have my guys been recording in the past few days? What was the temperature in the morning when there is a sun or in the day when there is a sun? And what is the temperature when the sun is not there? What is the, what is the range? If, let's say, during the day it's 35, 40, and then at night, we are reading 20. Mm. That's about 15, 16 degrees. That's wow. a whole lot. Yeah. You know, but if let's say during the day it's 28 mm. and in the evening it's 25, 26, mm. it's just two units, you know, and two units range compared to 15 units range, mm. you know. So when you see those things, mm. you know that your yield is going to go down. One of the, the things you will want to do is to start to replace part of your water. Okay. But that doesn't come for free, you know. Right. Energy cost now is okay. not a child's play. In this, uh, we are not privileged to to work in countries where, when you are farming, you have special rates for electricity. Here, you pay <laughs> well, a, lot well, a lot of money so, for energy. So your production so actually, costs will go very high during the during the 
the, the, the warm climate like this because okay. you have to keep replacing part of your water right. and know that as you are replacing the water also mm. you are going to have chemistry mm. issues mm. because when the animals get into the water like that you know when they got into the water it was very clear yeah. after some time they, everything will adjust and buffer mm. so now as you are bringing in new water you are creating some changes <laughs> maybe ph is different so it's, it's a ah. It's not easy it's as... There's a lot of technicalities, eh? Uh, so why, you need a lot of expertise. That, exactly, this is why we to need go people into to this understand area the sciences. Of fish farming. Uh, unfortunately for us, when you are studying science from science school, you either are told to become a doctor or a lawyer. Or a, a laboratory a technician. technician. Uh, this is basically science. science. Other people are approaching it from that level right. now. They teach you the science from the field. Mm. So that by the time you grow, you know where to... So now okay. you see how everything is connected. Yes, yes, I see, I see. Mr. Danso, we are wrapping up our interview, but your farm, Flow Cell, is not just a profit-making venture. It also serves as a training ground for university students who want places for attachment or even national service. How do you call, or what would you say to the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development to help some of you to sustain so that you can keep training younger ones to go out there and help fish farmers what would be your call my call will be to look at the knowledge gap in the industry uh, i think so far we have put too much attention on on fishing okay and fishing is like hunting you know and aquaculture is like animal husbandry mm. i think that's the best way to look mm. at it uh, you can build an economy on hunting mm. Right, but you can build an economy on husbandry. Okay. So uh, we need a lot of knowledge in the sector. Mm. Uh, we need a lot of young people to be trained. Mm. And, and believe me, if you are, and all of the young guys now are smart, they want smart devices yeah. and those yeah. things. And all these things are applicable in mm. agriculture. We've yeah. seen all kind of solutions, all kind of drones, all kind of devices that can be tagged into the fish, mm. monitoring the fish's heart rate. Very high technology, mm. all those things are there. We need the ministry to come in, support, so that we can advocate for the need for the gap to be closed in knowledge in aquaculture and food production. Mm. And we need resources, we need support mm. uh, to equip our universities, to equip the research institutions and those of us who have put out our facilities to support training. We, we need support from them so mm. that uh, we can we can all look back in the next 20, 50 years and say that yes, we've left behind a legacy that can guarantee mm. food security mm. for the future. Okay, some time passed, we heard that Chinese people or foreigners were the ones who were actually establishing big ponds and producing fishes and all that. If care is not taken, how far do you think climate change, uh, including other factors like feed, can affect food production in Ghana? Well, uh, the, the production of food is a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, it, it requires very big and serious investment. Right. Big and serious investment. It requires knowledge. It requires understanding. And it requires governance. Okay. So one, you cannot put only one of them out and mm. win. You mm. need almost all of them to come together for you to win. And what is missing so far is that we are not seeing a lot of serious investment, large ticket size investment on the side of Ghanaians. Okay. It's not like people do not want to do it. Either they don't have the right knowledge or they are not convinced that the right uh, uh, people are out there to help them to do it or, or the, the, the environment, mm. you know. And this is what is easier for the Chinese guys mm. and the other foreigners to mm. come with. To penetrate. To penetrate right. and invest like that okay. because they've seen it work in their mm. countries and mm. when they come here and they've mm. seen all the conditions that mm. are arrived, they say, oh, this is the perfect place to throw to start. my $20 million okay. or my $15 million. And then they can And that way, they are pushing the local people out they of the market. They will crush us because okay. we are not doing anything. Right. We are not doing anything. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure in the last five years, you can point out any serious Ghanaian-owned aquaculture mm. investment. Mm. Or even food, general food. You will not see any big one. Okay. And so we need a lot of attention in that area as well. Right. Otherwise, we live all our, our lives on foreign food. <laughs> <laughs> and that is definitely not 
something I want to do. Living my life entirely on foreign food. You no. Want, you want so keys? You're it's very, a no. <laughs> you're very, you're it's <laughs> a no, no. So this interview has been a must interview. I mean, it, it's something I had to do because climate change has become a global issue. Everybody is talking about it. Is it just the talkability or actions are being taken to address the situation? In the case of fish farming, aquaculture in Ghana, the ministry, what are you doing to assist these farmers? Farms are closing down at a fast pace and that is scary. It is causing people to go out of business. People are losing their jobs. They are losing their livelihood. There will be poverty and that will lead to catastrophe. The brothel is not coming. It will lead to problem, Charlie. Hunger. <laughs> so if you're an individual out there, if you're an investor hoping to go into fish farm, please take a clue from all that Mr. Dansu has said. It's not all about having money. You need knowledge. You need an expert to be part of the team to make it work. My name is Enyonam, and this has been an insightful interview on the Ghanaian farmer. If you want to go into fish farming and you need a farm to train you, you can contact Mr. Dan. But please, training is not free. I know a lot of you, but you'll be calling training. It's not free. So call us on 0554-830431. We'll give you the invoice. We'll connect you to the farm. you come for your training. And then you can go and start your business. Seek the knowledge before you invest your money. If not, you lose everything. Thank you very much for your Thank time. Thank you very much. We too. appreciate you. Bye-bye. <laughs>